What we are seeing is a movement to a world where every story, every brand, every sound, every image, every relationship plays itself out across the maximum number of media channels. The, in, the information system is converged, it's integrated. So store, we carry pieces of media with us all through the system. And that's being shaped top down by decisions made in corporate boardrooms and bottom up by decisions made in teenagers' bedrooms. In other words, it's shaped by the integration of the media industries so that the same company may own interest in all media platforms. And it's shaped by teenagers wanting the media they want, where they want it, how they want it, in the form they want it, when they want it, and their willingness to take it places illegally if it's not available to them legally. And those two pressures are working together to create a much more integrated media sector than we've seen before. We're in a moment of time where there's been rapid technological change and even more rapid social and cultural change. Now my argument is that the social and cultural change generally precedes races ahead of the technological change. That is, if you want to figure out where technology is going, see what people are doing now when it's hard, when they're struggling to achieve it and then make it easier for them to achieve. If we could really look at what consumers have been doing with media we can, uh, and, uh, and understanding how they're doing it over enormous difficulties, then we can predict much more precisely the technical needs that are going to go on. So as the early adapters precede it, they're the lead users, to use Eric von Hippel's terms. They're adapting technology to their own needs. Then as the technology becomes easier to use, it becomes more widespread across the population. So in a sense, culture precedes technology, but technology amplifies the trends of the culture and makes them available to a much larger segment of the population. Everyone is potentially a producer of media as well as a consumer of media. A world where sharing with each other what we create is mutually rewarding and has enormous emotional satisfaction. We can go back through the last 200 years of human history and see People have always struggled with the limits of the technology to figure out a way to share their ideas with each other and to communicate effectively across geographic distances. Middle of the 19th century, teenagers were taking toy printing presses where they had to set the type letter by letter and printing out zines and the American Amateur Press Association it goes back to the Civil War era. These things were circulating on the national scale you know, in the, in the middle of the 19th century. That's the same impulse that leads kids today to put content up on their Facebook page, to just put something out on YouTube, uh, to make their own song vids or whatever. That desire to create and share what you create with others is really, really powerful. Right now we're seeing that notion of participatory culture spill over politically. That I would say the success of the Obama campaign was based on the value of participatory culture. That you know, the McCain people tried to make Obama look like a celebrity, but their model of what a celebrity was, was a mass media celebrity. Whereas, in fact, what we've seen is that uh, people wanted to own Obama. They wanted to do things in the name of Obama. They wanted to connect with each other around and through Obama. That this was about what the people did. That Obama was simply a name attached to the bottom-up energies of participatory culture as large numbers of young people moved for the first time into the political process. The idea of collective intelligence is basic, is, comes out of the work of Pierre Levy. And what Pierre Levy tells us is that in a network society, nobody knows everything. Forget the idea of the Renaissance man. It's impossible to know everything. We all know that. We can't read everything in our inbox. That everybody knows something. That there's an enormous array of different kinds of expertise and knowledge out there that uh, we rely on to make sense of the world around us. And the more we broaden our access to those other kinds of expertise, the stronger position we're in ourselves. And that what any member knows is available to the network as a whole on an ad hoc basis. Collective intelligence is based on a notion of deliberation. That is, we pool our knowledge, we work through things together, we weigh possible solutions, we challenge each other's solutions, we lay out how we know things. This is very different from a system based on aggregation, uh, the so-called wisdom of crowds model. Some, so some, thing, some, writer, some industry people keep mashing these two things together. They're actually fundamentally separate ideas. The is, wisdom of crowds out of J, James Sirickey is that if each of us answer independently and, we, and without our influence from the other, and we aggregate that information and, we can, and average it out, that the answer we arrive at is more likely to be accurate than any individual is going to achieve on their own. 
So something like Dig, say, operates on an aggregative model. That is, Google works on an aggregative model. Each of us makes a decision, and those decisions collected together by some anonymous technology results in a better search engine than us independently. Wikipedia is based on a collective intelligence model. That is, the information is put out there. Underneath the hood of Wikipedia are complex, intense debates are going on about the reliability of information. Different people with different knowledge and different biases vet each other's entry. And over time, through a process, uh, you know, we arrive at better and better quality data via Wikipedia. So when I spoke to Jimmy Wales and I said to him, is that Wikipedia accurate? That's what people always want to know. And he says, wrong question. The question is not, is Wikipedia accurate? Because that treats it as a product. It's when is Wikipedia accurate? And that treats it as a process. And so the question is, for any given entry, where is it in this process of collective intelligence, of creative collaboration, of vetting, of debating, of refinement? How reliable is it in any given moment? And that requires us to develop skills and operating within a collective intelligence system so we weigh the reliability of information. It's confusing because people look at Encyclopedia Britannica and Wikipedia side by side and then think they're the same thing. They're not. One's a product of expert, uh, expert system. The other is a process of collective intelligence. And when you put your trust in Wikipedia, you're putting your trust in the process, while the product may at any given moment of time be more or less adequate because it's in the process of being built. Long term, the world we're moving toward is one where collective intelligence is going to reap much bigger rewards than an aggregation system. But we've got to learn how to live within it. We've got to acquire the skills needed to be part of a collective intelligence society. Right now, collective intelligence models are being applied most fully in our recreational life. So if you want to look at an alternate reality game, which is a large-scale scavenger hunt for information, teams of 100 to 1,000 people are pooling their knowledge and solving complex problems involving layer upon layer of cipher in very rapid time. And I would defy the central intelligence agency to keep up with a good team of you know playing an ARG in terms of their ability to break codes and, and, and understand the complexities of conspiracies and so forth. There are very few examples yet of full application of collective intelligence to solving real world problems. We have a lot to learn as a, as a world about how to function in such a system. And what we have are very ske you know, sketches of what a system would look like, but we're not there yet. It's hard to think of any place now where media isn't already. You know, uh, you go to the ballpark and people are watching media while they're watching the ball game because they can get access to additional information they wouldn't have otherwise. There's no place we go where there's not media being pumped at us to, to move products and there's not media we're pulling on to get access to information or remain connected to our friends and, and family. We are completely tethered to media. I'm seeing speakers on the podium, Twitter, while they're speaking messages to the audience and response to questions the audience is generating via Twitter at the same time. I can't do it. You know, I have colleagues who can lecture on video games and play them behind their back at the same time. This is a level of capacity in processing information and in managing our relations to media that if you grew up with are second nature and are already leaving my generation completely behind. So as that generation grows up and takes on more adult responsibilities, as they move into other institutions, that layer of annotation, of information, of augmentation is going to continue to grow.